Disclaimer, please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk, then play at half speed. Thank you. Hey, Nigel, uh, mind if I get my laptop back? I'm really going to need it for tonight's movie stream. Um, yeah. Uh, just a heads up, though. I think there's something wrong with it. What the hell happened? Like, I have no idea. I had it on for, like, I don't know, like five minutes, and it just started, like, catching on fire all on its own. Is this... Did you fill this with coins? I was mining bitcoins, sir. You know, make a little side money. I mean... That and I think you need a better graphics card. It really didn't work right. That's not how Bitcoins work at all! You're in tech support too! You know this! Gee, now how am I going to stream tonight's movie? Well, just use the spare laptop over there. Fine. Just let me swap the connections. Lord, when was the last time this thing was updated? <sighs> all the time for Josh to be on vacation. Although, with him gone... We can finally watch the movies we really want to watch. Ooh, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Snuff Western. film! What? What? Hey guys, what's going on? It's not mine! Josh. <clears throat> Josh, I thought you were visiting family. I am. Then how are you here? Oh, I just took the elevator. Wait, isn't that our time elevator as last seen in episode 43? Yep, I made... Uh, few modifications, so now it can travel through not only time, but space. Oh, and dimensions. So, uh, I call it the time and relative stop, dimensions. Stop, 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 stop. I'm gonna stop you right there. Really don't want to get sued by the BBC. But you did say it could go into space? Oh, yeah, easy. It's like beep boop and we're there. You wanna try it out? Oh, yeah, holy cow, yeah! Oh, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to space. To infinity and beyond! Don't put that I'm not there. getting sued by Disney. Come back. It's now on my... so, Somebody there? I could have swore I heard something. Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. have to understand that thing is out there ronald lacy and buckaroo bonsai can't be reasoned with plus the parents are dead clancy brown to highlander can't be bargained with christopher lambert to mortal Kombat doesn't feel pity just like kari hiroyuki tagawa to the art of war doesn't feel remorse off, or michael bean and aliens doesn't feel fear <laughs> It absolutely will not stop. Get down. Until you take Jeanette Goldstein to Terminator 2. Judgment Day is coming to firepit.podbean.com as Dan, Tom, and Josh make their own fate and face the 90s summer blockbuster Terminator 2 Judgment Day. It's the vacation determination every Tuesday here at the Fire Pit. Hasta la vista, baby. Come on, whoever, which one of you jackasses has the... Oh, it's me. <clears throat> Boy, he really is on vacation. Yeah. I'm uh. all of this, by the way. <laughs> Good evening, bots and listeners, and welcome to the fire pits. I'm Josh. Vacation name, Josh. I'm still on vacation. I'm on vacation, and we are excited to kick off the first episode of our latest journey, The Vacation 2 Termination. Excited for this fourth, fourth journey of season two. We are underway, and uh, well, we're going to make our way to the classic sequel, Terminator 2 Judgment Day. But first, we need a launching point, and tonight's episode should be... Should be interesting. I have no idea what to expect. I'll more on that later. But as per our rules, we took an actor or an actress from our last film, and we moved them on over to this one. Now to tell us more about who we're watching and what we're watching, I'm going to send things over to Tom as I sip my mojito. Thank you, Josh, British name Reginald. Thompson here, 
on the clock named Tom. And last week, or two weeks ago, we watched Harrison Ford swing into action in his first outing as famed adventure archaeologist and sometimes lover Indiana Jones in Raiders of the Lost Ark. In the climax of that film, Ronald Lacey's face literally melted right off to the sheer awesomeness of that film. And tonight, his face will melt in the sheer WTF that is tonight's film. The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. A sci-fi film that sees a polymath adventurer save the galaxy with a ragtag group of his alien buddies. But to give us a bit of a rundown on the film and a spot of trivia, I swivel the mic over to Nigel. Thank you, Tom. Evening, folks. I'm Dan, British name Nigel, and as mentioned tonight, we are watching The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. Never seen this film. Have no idea what I'm getting involved in. Someone I know described it as Cowboy Bebop on a bad acid trip. So, can't wait. Um, It had a release date of August 15th, 1984. So we're just shy of of an anniversary here. A uh, running time of 102 minutes. It had a budget of 17 million and uh, sad music. Uh, box office of 6.3 million. Ba-dum, ba-dum. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fail, failing Price is Right music here. Because um, <laughs> the price was not right. This movie didn't even make half its budget back. Oof. Uh, it has a Rotten Tomato score of 68% with an audience score of 69%. Nice. nice. Although I don't know where there's such a big divide there. 68 to 69 is pretty close. Yeah, it's a, no, it's a pretty wide gap. I mean, I don't understand where the divide is. Anyways, it has an IMDb of six and a half out of 10. So it puts it right up there with some of the movies that we've kind of lambasted on this show. Uh, <coughs> Squashbuckler. <coughs> yeah, yeah. It's, 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 in, it's in Swashbuckler territory as far as Rotten Tomato and IMDb scores go. Was Swashbuckler really a six point five? Because that's high. It was a s- uh, well six something. I thought. Uh, I mean, it's still not well, the worst. Type in Swas S W A S into Google. By the way, good to know. First thing that's recommend. Okay, I'm Bing. I'm sorry, I, I do Bing. But uh, first thing that pops up is Swastika, and I'm like, no, no. do not put that in my history. Thank you, Josh, for being the pioneer. Anyways, uh, to answer the question, Swashbuckler was a 6 out of 10 on IMDb. So this is only slightly higher. It was a 44% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yes. But focusing back on this film, um, yeah, I'm a little cautiously optimistic, but we haven't got to expectations yet. I do have a bit of trivia on this film, if you guys are interested. I am. Fire away. Yeah. Um, I don't... I mean, there's a lot of trivia to this movie, and I had to kind of pull it back a little bit. Uh, I found it interesting that this movie was almost unavailable for a while. This film was actually supposed to be a franchise, and uh, they wanted to do a sequel, but obviously it, it this bombed so bad that the studio wasn't going to make a sequel. But the sequel was allegedly blocked by a rights holder for fear that the associated paperwork might uncover his creative bookkeeping. Um, it also led to the video going out of print for nearly a decade. So after 1992, you couldn't find this film legally on video until 2002 when they released the DVD. So someone was fudging the tax numbers. Yeah. I couldn't uncover more into it, but yeah, Um, it's kind of interesting. I don't want to step on Tom's toes too much with the meta, but this movie does feature quite a few actors who are only about a year or two away from their breakout roles. And um, it's kind of interesting if this movie had been successful and had gotten a sequel, we may not have had Peter Weller, as um, Terminator, or not Terminator, RoboCop. We may not have had Christopher Lloyd as Doc Brown because uh, they may have been busy filming the sequel when Back to the Future and RoboCop were being filmed. So in, in another universe where this movie was a big hit, other actors played RoboCop and Doc Brown. I can't see that. So I'm kind of glad that this movie didn't uh, get that sequel. I will admit, though, now I'm curious to see Terminator with Peter Weller. I am, too. <laughs> I can't believe I accidentally said Peter Weller. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, you can 
watch it because he didn't have enough film to do multiple takes. But uh, apparently John Lithgow was like ad libbing a ton of his lines and most of the people are losing their shit while he's talking on camera. In fact, it got so bad towards the end of the film that Christopher Lloyd had to put his uh, character's space helmet on so that he would stop laughing (laughs) or at least it wouldn't be seen on camera. (laughs) Stop having fun while filming. Damn it. (laughs) Yeah. There's a character in the movie, I think, new, named New Jersey, but their response to Buckaroo, uh, he couldn't sing, but he could dance, is actually a Fred Astaire reference uh, to screen tests from Fred Astaire's editions in the or, or in the golden age of Hollywood. He, uh, uh, yeah, he, he, could, he could dance, or he couldn't sing, but he could dance. That's why in a lot of Fred Astaire's movies, he doesn't sing. Or when you can dance like Fred Astaire, why do you need to sing? Yeah. But uh, there's a lovely little Star Trek connection. Of course there is in this <laughs> film. Take, Take a drink. Um, <laughs> Uh, the quote of this movie, no matter where you go, there you are, is the dedication plaque or the dedication quote for the USS Excelsior, later seen in Star Trek 3, which beat this movie in the box office, and Star Trek 6. Oh, and mentioned in Star Trek 4. Um, yeah, I thought that was cool. No matter where you go, there you are, are is the dedication quote for the USS Excelsior in Star Trek canon. Now, that- the, the movies may have come out before or around the same time and beat it, but do you think the plaque um, dedication was made uh, because of Buckaroo Banzai? Maybe like someone was a fan of the movie and just put that into like canon. That like, I that I don't know. I'm not sure because the movies were probably being filmed around the same time because did the the two movies did come out at the same time, so I or on the same year. So I'm pretty sure Star Trek three and this movie were being filmed at the same time. So I and they're not made by the same studio. So mm-hmm. I don't think that. The, the plaque is a reference to Buckaroo Banzai, nor do I think the quote in Buckaroo Banzai is a reference to Star Trek. Mm-hmm. So I think it's just a coincidence. Yeah, I um, like coincidence. However, this Star Trek reference is definitely not a coincidence. There's an object in the movie called the Oscillation Overthruster. You can see it on the bulkhead of Zephyr Cochran's ship when he and Riker and Geordi are flying for the first warp uh, flight in Star Trek First Contact. That is not a coincidence. That is absolutely a reference to Buckaroo Banzai. Nice. So, so I got a question, and feel free to edit this part out if I am stepping on toes. But uh, is this an original IP? Buckaroo? Yeah. Uh, I think it is. The movie did spawn a couple of comics because the movie didn't get a sequel. So someone wrote comics to kind of explain what the what the what potential sequels could have been like. But I think at the time this movie was made, this was an original IP. I think. I can confirm that, and I'll go a little bit more to that. Yeah, because Tom, yeah, Tom, Tom's Tom's the meta guy, and he's the one who always says it's based on the book or short story or whatever. So yeah, well, I was just thinking back to our Flash Gordon and how you gave a lot of trivia on how it was where it came from as far as the comic strips. So I was just wondering if this had any source material. Um, I, I I haven't seen this film, but judging from what I watched in the trailer and what I saw in some of the stills, it definitely looks like it was inspired by some of the more wackier sci-fi elements of Flash Gordon and um buck rogers and crazy stuff like that mm-hmm. and i could definitely see just from the images that this movie uh, i've seen online uh the images and stuff in this movie has definitely inspired some animes the aforementioned <laughs> cowboy bebop being one of them oh yes but um i've got some other trivia as the movie goes along i don't like i said i didn't really have a whole lot because a lot of it's spoilery and a lot of the trivia actually is a lot of meta stuff about the actors and actresses that were in this film because this is about a movie or two before their breakout role and i didn't want to step too much on tom's toes he talks enough and i didn't want to take too much of his slides when he does his meta (laughs) thanks nigel Well, Josh can barely tolerate one of us rambling on about the meta. I can't imagine what he would do if two of us were rambling on about it. I'm seriously like about ready to bust out a timer and go like beep, 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 beep. I'm like, see, it's not me calling you guys out. It's the timer. I'm seeing the hook, people. I'm seeing the hook. <laughs> so uh, that's the only thing I got. Um, yeah, this movie was a stillborn franchise. It was supposed to be uh, the first of a franchise of films. And it bombed so bad that never happened. In fact, uh, it has a James Bond-esque ending where, you know how at the end of a lot of the James Bond movies, it would say James Bond will return in Diamonds Are Forever or whatever. Like it would name the next movie. The end of this film says, Buckaroo Banzai will return in Buckaroo Banzai against the World Crime League. And it never happened. A shame. Yes. Um, But that's all I got for trivia. Josh, box office numbers. Do you have what? them? I know you're on vacation, but what? did you at what? least take what? 10 minutes to look up some box office numbers? What? I'm on vacation. Tom, the meta. 
I do. I do. Buckaroo Banzai premiered August 10th, 1984 on its opening weekend. You guys, whew, you guys are going to be impressed with how what it where where it was at on the box office its opening weekend. It premiered at and wait for it, 16th on the box office. Wow. It it pulled in a grand total of $620,000 in 236 theaters. Damn. Yes. So, do you guys care to take a whack at the movie that premiered the same weekend, but premiered at number one? Star Trek. That was 1984. So, Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock? Did, this movie came out in August? August 10th, 1984. Uh, August 84. Temple of Doom? No, Temple of Doom was in the box office, but it was on its 12th week of release. Oh, Ghostbusters? That was on its 10th week of release at number two. Then I also, I already mentioned Star Trek 3 earlier, yeah. so. It actually wasn't in the box office, at least as it was reported here. The number one movie for this weekend on its opening weekend was Red Dawn. Oh, oh nice. Yes, okay. it, it grossed $8.2 million in 1,822 theaters. At number two was Ghostbusters, like I said before, on its 10th week of release, pulling in $5.7 million. At number three was Purple Rain, pulling in four point eight. million. At number four was Revenge of the Nerds, pulling in $4.3 million. Number five was The Karate Kid, or as they say, The Karate Kid, if mm-hmm. you want to act like you know what you're talking about but don't actually. Other notables in the box office this weekend... Gremlins at number six. Also premiering was Cloak and Dagger. I don't know what that one's about. But uh, at number nine was Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Ten was The Never Ending Story. Twelve was Bachelor Party. Thirteen, Muppets Take Manhattan. Fourteen, The Philadelphia Experiment. And at fifteen was The Last Starfighter. Wow. Quite a few of those movies are movies I want to do on the podcast someday. Yes. Some of those I... I mean, love Last Starfighter. Was Last Starfighter premiering or had it been in the theater for a while? Uh, on its fifth week of release. I thought as much. I thought as mm-hmm. much. That it fell that far that fast is actually not that surprising. But damn. Honestly, I think the one thing that impresses me the most out of this particular weekend is the fact that the only sequel is Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. You know, you're right. Considering the box office nowadays... If it's not a part of a franchise, it's not getting made. I mean, if you look at it, a lot of these spawned a lot of sequels. (laughs) The movie we're watching tonight is excluded, as Dan said earlier. (laughs) Philadelphia Experiment got a sequel. Never Ending Story got a sequel. Indiana Jones, as we know, got a couple sequels. Um, Gremlins got a sequel. Karate Kid did too. So did Revenge of the Nerd and Ghostbusters. How did Philadelphia Experiment get a sequel? It was about a ship that traveled through time. It got progressively more stupid. It did. I think the sequel, I remember watching it, but it was about a stealth fighter going back in time and then alternate reality type thing. It was, it was, honestly, I remember it not being dumb, but I was also probably like 10. Fair point. But anywho, that's all I've got for the box office. So uh, Thompson. Yes. We can go on to expectations now, right? Uh, no. <laughs> yes actually it's time for expectations <laughs> we're not hopping in the time elevator josh we're going through this Ding. i'm on vacation welcome to the adventures of buckaroo bonsai across the eighth dimension your vacation away from high quality movies tagline <laughs> beings from another dimension have invaded your world you can't see them but they can see you. Your only hope is Buckaroo Banzai. Summary. Adventurer, brain surgeon, rock musician, Buckaroo Banzai, played by Peter Weller, and his crime-fighting team, the Hong Kong Cavaliers, must stop evil alien invaders from the eighth dimension who are planning to conquer Earth. Essentially, this is what would happen if Lucas and Spielberg binged on cocaine and made the most 80s Indiana Jones Star Wars crossover possible. 
This film movie was 10 years in the making by people who had this in their minds since college, was meant to be a love letter to 1970s kung fu films and you know, those 1940s pulp films that would inspire Star Wars with all the actors encouraged to find the top and go as far over it as possible with no management paying any attention to stop them. So a fun production. And speaking of producers, this was produced by Neil Canton and W.D. Richter, who made the production company so they could make this film. Incidentally, Canton would go on to uh, produce Back to the Future, Witches of Eastwick, and Get Carter, Richter, not so much. Richter would direct this, W.D. Richter, which is odd because he was mostly a writer. He did Invasion of the Body Snatchers and Big Trouble in Little China. And this was his first film that he ever like directed, and one of his only ones, too. Don't know why he chose to do it, but he chose to do it. But at least he chose... Well, I don't know why he chose someone else to write it either. Earl Mac Rauk, um, a novelist um, that Richter hired for this. As Nigel noted, this is completely original uh, IP. They had come up with this idea since college. They tooled around with it. It took them 10 years uh, to really get it together. But they hired Earl Mac Rauk, who had did a novel called Dirty Pictures from the Prom. and. They said, we like the book. He, he had uh, written some other movies, one called New York, New York with Liza Minnelli and De Niro and A Stranger is Watching with Kate Mulgrew, which actually looks interesting. So he did have some movies under his belt. So he wasn't just a novice, but weird choices all around just in terms of who's going to help create the film. But in front of the camera, as Nigel noted, a lot of these people would go on to bigger and better things. And actually a few of them were up and comers. I'm going to go through the list, but I'm going to focus on only three of them. Otherwise we're going to be here all day. Uh, we got Peter Weller, John Lithgow, Ellen Barkin, Jeff Goldblum, Christopher Lloyd, Clancy Brown, Robert Ito, Ronald Lacey, Vincent Chevalli, who plays John Connor in this. Excuse me, John O'Connor. And the list goes on and on. I'm just going to focus on Peter Weller, John Lithgow, and Ellen Barkin. Peter plays the titular protagonist, Buckaroo Banzai, a dramatic actor who was on the up and up would eventually go on to do RoboCop not long after this, and other films such as Star Trek Into Darkness and Leviathan. As the antagonist, we have John Lithgow as Lord John Worfin slash Dr. Emilio Lizardo. And he is a character actor, and my God, he gets to be all of the character in this film. He even talked about this in interviews, um, how it's like some films like um, Twilight Zone and others would you know, say you can kind of, you know, go crazy with the role, but they never really let him go crazy with the role. This one, they let him go crazy with the role. And he had a blast making it. Everyone did because of him. Uh, but other roles he's known for, Harry and the Hendersons, Shrek, where he was Lord Farquaad, and the dance-hating dad from Footloose. But the love interest was played by Ellen Barkin, character named Penny Pretty, also a performance actress coming off of um, Diner not too long before this. Her star was rising. Uh, she would eventually go on to do The Big Easy and Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. So, again, these are some people that had names kind of behind them, even if they weren't headliners themselves. And I've already mentioned everyone else, that the members of the Hong Kong Cavaliers, and we're going to love each and every one of them. Uh, in terms of awards, though, no awards when it was made, but since its release, it has been kind of regarded as a slightly ahead of its time while also being a very much a product of its time sort of film 
Entertainment Weekly ranked Buckaroo Banzai as number 43 in their top 50 cult movies. And The Guardian has cited Buckaroo Banzai as one of their 1,000 films to see before you die. So congratulations, guys. We get to see one of those 1,000 films before we die. Again, there's more with the characters. There's more behind the scenes, too, which I will add to Nigel as we watch this. But in terms of expectations, I think I'm the only one that's seen this film. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we mentioned that on selection section because Josh and I hadn't seen it. And I'm glad I waited till I was an adult to watch this because kid me, teenage me would have hated this film. This really is just a bizarre movie. I think it was at Gateway they had it. And I think Danielle or a couple other people had mentioned seeing the film before and just noted how weird it was. So I was like, I figure I'll give it a shot. And oh boy, this is a bizarre one. A good bizarre. This isn't like Videodrome or Eraserhead weird. This is kind of the over the top that um, Flash Gordon was trying to be, but still makes sense, which Flash Gordon failed to do. Um, and I, again, I saw it in theaters and the whole time I was like, what the hell am I watching? I am so glad I am watching it now. And everyone else in the theater with me, there weren't that many people. Um, surprise. They had either seen it or were being taken by people to see it. So hearing their reactions to made this a nice treat. So I'm looking forward to getting your two opinions about this. But Josh. What are your expectations going into Buckaroo Banzai? I'm on vacation. Will this make this a better vacation, though? I don't know. I have no idea what to expect out of this. Um, if you listen to the selection section, I went for the longest time thinking this was a kangaroo movie. <laughs> so I'm just expecting... I have no expectations for this film. If I'm entertained, I will be happy. It is a product of the 80s, so I can only hope that it's going to, you know, respect its decade. <laughs> I think this movie kind of sums up the decade. Sums it up four years in. Yes. I can respect that. So I guess if I come out of this movie with a even... If I think it's as mediocre as it was... The Black Widow movie, I'll be happy. <laughs> it's better than Black Widow, I'll give it that much. You at least get Jeff Goldblum in this. Well, that's not saying much. Spoiler alert, I, I liked Black Widow, but it was very cookie cutter. Anywho, that's, like I said, I don't have much for expectations on this film. Let's put it like this. Best bet, it's Tango and Cash. Worst bet, it's Swashbuckler. If it comes out of that, like... It was a mediocre movie that we thought we saw within recently. Well, there was Nighthawks. No, I hated that movie. Mm, 21 Bridges, but no, you'd like that film. Um, I like the movie, but I acknowledge it's not a great one. I would say probably Speed. Like, Speed was fun, but okay. I still, it's a middle of the road movie. So if I could come out thinking it's as good as Speed, or at least in that vicinity, I'll be happy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's that's all I've got for it. Nigel, what about you? To, again, quote my favorite YouTube channel, OSW Review, I'm going to say this, I'm expecting bollocks out of this film. And those that listen to that podcast as well, I'm going to say the Halloween Havoc 1995 bollocks. Oh, that's mean. That's No, no, no. That's the debut of the Yeti. So as someone else uh, I know said Cowboy Bebop on an acid trip. I'm kind of expecting that. I don't know. This movie's always kind of piqued my curiosity. I've never gotten around to watching it. And it came up twice on lists I was coming up with. Technically a third time when Tom presented it on one of his lists. I'm like, Destiny's telling me I need to see this film. I think what I'm looking forward to is, I mentioned in my trivia, this movie is like uh, most of the role stars in this film. They're only like one or two movies away from their breakout roles. So I'm kind of looking forward to seeing like pre-Robocop Peter Weller. Because like most of the characters he plays after Robocop that I've seen him in, like Star Trek Into Darkness or Leviathan, he kind of plays a super serious, kind of a stoic person. 
and he doesn't seem like he's doing that in this film. I don't know. I haven't seen it, but I did watch the trailer. And uh, I know he's an accomplished musician, actually, in real life. So is he, though? Yeah, he is. Uh, he, he studied at the University of North Texas. I think he studied the trumpet or the trombone or something like that. But yeah, he, he plays some of his own music in this movie. So oh, cool. Yeah. So like, yeah, yeah. Cause like, you know, he's great in Robocop and I liked him in Star Trek into darkness. The movie itself is weak, but I liked his character and I'll die on the hill that the movie would have been better if he'd have been the main bad guy. But he, he always plays that kind of character in movies today. He always plays like super stoic, super serious characters. So looking forward to that. And I am, I kind of looking forward to seeing like pre doc Brown, Christopher Lloyd. Like I want to see Christopher Lloyd at his most Christopher Lloyd. Uh, um, Christopher Lloyd as John Big Booty. Yeah, yeah. And Lithgow's always hilarious. Third Rock from the Sun is still one of my favorite sitcoms of all time because of John Lithgow. <laughs> that guy is a comic genius. So I think I'm just, I, I don't know. That's what I'm looking forward to the most. I like sometimes I, these movies might not be good. Like Nighthawks wasn't good, but it was kind of interesting to see pre Rambo Stallone. Um, so. In drag. <laughs> in drag twice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> The best part of those movies. Yeah. Like I said, it, it was kind of cool to see pre pre Rambo Stallone kind of films, Uh, you know, so I, I that's what I'm looking forward to. That's that's what I'm looking forward to. I'm just looking forward to seeing some of these actors in the roles before they were famous. Kind of like getting to see your favorite band when they were still a garage band. So mm-hmm. but you're thinking it's going to suck, though. I don't think it's going to be great, but I, I'm, I'm kind of hoping maybe not expecting, but really hoping that it's just another tango in cash or, or it's like a surprise where I think it's going to be bad. Cause I really do think this is going to be a bad film. Yeah. But, I think that's a good hope for this film. I realize as you're telling your expectations, I didn't give any expectations. I gave what I'm hoping for. I think my expectations, this movie's going to suck. So I'm just going to lay that out there now and I can, I will eat my words later. <laughs> we, we haven't had the best success on this film or on this podcast of cult classics. This is true. Movies that are considered cult classics. Like, we hated Flash Gordon. Yes. That movie's got a huge fan base of people that love that film. I contend that those people have never actually watched it. They've just listened to the soundtrack. Oh, you like Queen. So, oh, yeah, I love Flash Gordon because I love Queen. Watch the damn film. Yeah. I like Queen, too. Flash Gordon sucks. Um, or they've seen Ted, so they thought it was a good movie. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, they've seen Ted or they've seen the parodies on Family Guy or something. But Flash Gordon's got the huge following and we hated that film. Nighthawks, all I heard going into that film, it's an underrated gem. It's an underrated gem. It's so weird that that could have been Stallone's career as a super serious cop or a super serious like actor like that. And I watched that film and I'm like, this movie's boring as hell. No wonder why he started shooting everybody in Rambo. It's like, <laughs> well, that seems to be the trend too. It's like the hyped up films. Cause we saw the natural and that's supposed to be like one of the best base right, movies right. ever made. And that was yeah, wretched. Like, like yeah. top six. Well, no, even though we watched the movie, we thought it was like, Dan started off, gave his final thoughts saying he liked it. I came in, I liked it, but I had a couple of reservations. And then Tom ruined the movie for us, as he does. <laughs> well, no, pointing- Tom doesn't always ruin the movie. It's just that Tom made one really good point, and I started backtracking the rest of the film in my head as Tom was going through his thoughts. And Tom made don't, one don't really good point. My joke. Oh, okay. My <laughs> bad. I'm sorry. I was trying to defend Tom there for a minute. My I, bad. I it, forgot it, the it, rules it, of the podcast. We do not yeah, defend Tom under any not circumstances. Defend Tom. Right. Sorry. Defend Tom a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, no. But you're you're right. You're right. Tom pointed out one thing and it was just like a house of cards. It came all down. Yeah. But a lot of these movies that are cult classics or like you see the reviews and they're like, oh, this is a fun film. Like they said the same thing about Swashbuckler. This is a fun movie. What a fun summer romp through, you know, oh, yeah, uh, swash, swash, yeah, swashbuckling pirates. But even some of the like IMDb reviews were like, this is a fun, cute little movie. And I'm watching it going, Sir, no, no, like, a fun pirate movie is Hook. This is not a fun pirate movie. Maybe it's one of those things that only people who like after, after a movie's been out for a while, only people who are actively looking for cheesy movies are going to be the ones who find those movies and they watch it. They like those kind of movies and they're in the minority of those who are going to watch it. So it's like any sane person who watches that movie is going to hate this yeah. movie. The only movie that I can think of recently, and I, I can't go through our entire catalog in my head. So if I'm missing any audience will surely let me know. 
either in Discord or on Twitter, but the only movie that I can think of that is considered that was a box office bomb and is considered a cult classic that the three of us loved was The Thing. Yeah. That's yeah. The only, that, that's the only one I can think of because it was a box office bomb, but later became a cult classic, and the three of us loved that film. Yes. Yeah, yes. and Tango and Cash. No, Tango and Cash wasn't a box office bomb. Oh yeah, that's it, right. It, it, but it, it made bank. Yeah, it made bank, and it's it's but it's not considered a good film. But like the other movies that are like cult classics, like Blade Runner, box office bomb became a cult classic. All three of us had wildly varying opinions of that film. Tom loved it. I was indifferent towards it. Josh didn't like it. Like I said, we came around to hating the natural. I mean, we still talk about how bad Swashbuckler was a year later. Um, now, like, where would uh, Slipstream fit on that one? Because we were all kind of indifferent to that one. That one, but the thing difference between that one is that one never attained cult classic status. Yeah, over the top enough. This will be a nice little compare and contrast between Slipstream and this film because there were elements to Slipstream that you could see potential, like when they went to that vault world, that Fallout rich person cave dwelling, or they they went to the um the mountain people where they basically crucified what's his name on a kite it's like okay this stuff is interesting do we have to have the stuff with luke skywalker though i mean this doesn't seem oh come to really on work. luke skywalker was the best part of that movie he did his best i mean he tried not to be luke skywalker but it just wasn't enough it didn't yeah i mean i can honestly I, mark hamill's performance in that movie did bother me i just thought that that movie could have been better if it had a little more money yeah. Like that just that was what was really hurting with it. it. They didn't have the money for like another script writer to come in and doctor the script up a little bit. And they didn't have the budget for a, some better special effects, you know, because yeah. some of the special effects in that film, like I might as well have seen the string on the UFO if you get my drift. Like it's yeah. mm-hmm. it was pretty rough in some spots and it really bogged down when they found that underground or oh, yeah. mountain hide mountain hideaway with all the rich people in it. It's like then the movie just ground to a fucking halt. But um, or as Dan pointed out, when Mark Hamill wasn't in it, Tom, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but um, like I said, we're not talking about Slipstream, but I don't think Slipstream is a cult classic. I, I agree with Tom. It's not as wacky and over the top to attain cult status. I was indifferent towards that film. I'm not in a hurry to watch it again, but it didn't. Well, then again, it. I don't think wacky over the top is necessary to obtain cult cult classic status. I mean, look at the thing. No, that's definitely not wacky. That is a very serious movie. No, but what, what, what attains that this. one, what helps that one, though, is not so much the over the top acting. It's the really amazing practical special effects that were over the top. Mm. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That really it, helps it. Yeah, because yeah, I've honestly, seen the original thing from another world. And yeah, the special effects in that one are way too ground. And it, Carpenter just went like, nope, we're going to have a spider head. We're going to have a dude <laughs> whose chest eats arms. Like, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Wacky. Okay, I see what you're saying. Wacky over the top special effects. Yeah, yeah like I said, so the acting in the thing is very subdued and very serious and very good. But the special effects really are over the top. Not cartoony over the top, but definitely like over the top. But going back to my original point about this film, and, and Tom was saying it too, like our, our podcast the three of us have not had great success with cult classic films. We either loathe them or we have three very different opinions of them. And the only one I could think of where we all universally loved it was the thing. I mean, we mm-hmm. did come away from that movie going, Ooh, I was like riding a really good roller coaster. I want to go on again, <laughs> you know, but yeah. that's my expectations of this film. I don't, I don't know. My expectations are pretty low. I don't think this is going to be a great film, but I, I'm right there with you. I don't think it's going to be a great film. I'm honestly expecting not to like it. It's an interesting film, a fascinating film, and I thought I found it enjoyable in a "what the hell is this film" sort of way. But you know, it's it's not it's not going to win the Emmys. Well, you know, it's it's one of those things. If if I, I'm I'm I, I'm expecting this movie to suck, <laughs> but if I will gladly eat crow if I thoroughly enjoy this movie. But regardless, I'm on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and with Josh's vacation, um, we've all given our expectations of it. And I did find some other people that have given their expect, well, not their expectations, but their opinions of this film. Excellent segue, Nigel. Thank you. 
So I was thinking that I will share some of these opinions with you gentlemen and you guys can guess the score and whoever wins gets to do this next week. It's not going to be. Now is that the prize or? (laughs) Yes. Wait, so so if you win, you have to do more work. Well, I'm on vacation next week, so yes. Okay. (laughs) I feel like... May the losing streak continue. (laughs) (laughs) This is going to be like opposite of the movie Tag, where Jeremy Renner was never tagged. I'm going to be that good where I never win. (laughs) You're just going to keep sloughing them off. (laughs) Tell Josh might have IMDb open on a browser and he knows what scores are. And he's going, oh, that one Dandry, and that's a six. I'm going to say two. <laughs> All right. So go ahead, Dan. All right. Well, since Josh is on vacation, we'll start with Josh. God damn it. <laughs> so what are the rules, Nigel? Standard? Um... Standard rules. Um, I'm, um, well, I'll be honest with you guys. I've been really busy the last week, so uh, I haven't had time to really parse a lot of reviews, but I, I'm going to use the titles today because I love doing that. I love when the title makes it sound like it's going to be a great film and they fucking hated it, or when the title makes it seem like it's going to be a bad film, but they were indifferent towards it. We had a few of those for Indiana Jones, didn't we? Yeah, we did. We did. But the same format applies. Uh, score out of 10. Whoever gets the closest without going over gets the point. You get it right on the money. You get two points. And I got five questions and one tiebreaker. So we're going to start with Josh. All right. Let's do it to it. All right, Josh. The title is Don't Be Mean. Don't Be Mean. Uh, eight out of ten. I'm going to say six out of ten. Ooh, Josh is closest. That's a ten-star review. <laughs> Your plan backfires, Josh. It's horribly. Should have said two. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Tom, all the magic is gone. That's a two-star review. Oh, all the magic is gone. Six out of ten. <laughs> Josh, it's a seven. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, maybe Tom's the one that doesn't want to win. He's the one that's got IMDb open. He's like, Dan just read a seven-star review. I'm going to say two. <laughs> All right, Josh, back to you. <laughs> no matter where you go, there you are. Uh, four out of ten. I'm going to say ten out of ten. Tom is the closest, even though he went over, but it's an eight star review. God, I almost said eight too. <laughs> that would have been great if you'd have got it right on the money. That would have been, been. been amazing. I would have stopped right then and there and called you the winner, not read the rest of the questions. <laughs> All right, Tom. Yes. Okay. The move. Oh, th- this it starts off like this. Okay. This makes no sense, but boy, is it fun. Eight out of ten. Ten out of ten. Tom gets that one. It's a nine star. <laughs> oh, we're tied up now, Tom. We are, you guys are tied. Okay. Josh, the most amazing thing I wish I'd never seen. Oh, part of me which wants to say 10 out of 10. Uh, three out of 10. Five out of 10. Tom, right on the money. That's a five star review. Woo! See, I was actually trying to win. <laughs> Now I wish I had sandbags so Josh could have got his comeuppance. (laughs) So I won. Yes. (laughs) Well, there is one more question. But that was the fifth one, wasn't it? That was the fifth one, yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm still curious about the tiebreaker. Yeah, yeah, definitely do the tiebreaker. All right, Josh. Too cool to call it garbage. Two. Seven. Mm, Tom would have been the outright winner. That's an eight. Tom was the outright winner, so. Well, either way. So, vacation, Josh, successfully vacationed <laughs> away from trivia. Yeah, I, I'm on vacation. So, <laughs> Well, let's hope Tom's not on vacation because we need him to play the music. <laughs> Tom, play the music. Well, welcome back to another dimension breaking episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersonal host, editor, and man of action, Tom. 
and you're just in time, too. We're just about to bust the dimensional barrier and travel to the multiverse. All we gotta do is drive this rocket truck through this mountain, and we'll be there in a flash. I know what I'm doing. I'm a podcaster. <laughs> but thank you for hopping into the passenger seat with us here at the fire pit. The team has put the rocket car into high gear and is looking to start their vacation to Termination. There are still a lot of barriers before they reach Terminator 2 Judgment Day, but no matter where they go, there they are. And by there, they mean here on this podcast. But speaking of going places, let's see how the team's space travels are going right now. Really? Well, that was certainly an experience. Now let us never speak of it again. Man, I don't know what your problem was. Dan and I had a blast. I know, right? I mean, we laughed, we cried. We caused the collapse of an entire alien monarchy. Good times, classic elevator fun in the fire pit. I even got this nifty alien souvenir. Now I just gotta find some place to put it. Guys, you notice anything different about our office? Like what? Like that it's on fire? Oh yeah, it is. I was too busy noticing the armies of cyborgs laying waste to humanity outside. Did one of you plug the Tombot into the internet while I was gone? I don't know. Tom, did you? Back to the time elevator. Tom, I swear to God, you're Fuck always Tom. using Tom. Don't, don't sit this damn elevator. Just, I, just, I can't go on vacation no, for five minutes. Mine's in big coins. You into the universe. Oh my God. Jeez, I'm getting Fox. tired of. For fuck's sake. I'm getting tired of Tom Bot. Yeah, we need to put him into a box and forget about him for another 20 episodes. <laughs> they leave the planet for five minutes. <sighs> But if you have some ad requests that you want to leave, or if you want to leave a review of some past episodes, or if you just have some thoughts you want to leave for us to read, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put fire pit in the subject line, as well as the subject of your email. Whether it's to commission an ad, send us some fan art, ask a question, get an answer, make a statement, or whatever else it is that has you chomping at the bit, and send it on over. From there, we'll read it, send it on over to our crack team of adventurer scientists, send it through the barrier to the 8th dimension, and never respond. Now the Wi-Fi signal gets pretty spotty once you get past the 5th and 6th dimensions. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com Capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com Go, oh, and that sound means we're approaching the barrier! I'm gonna break on through to the other side, and I'll let you all get back to the episode. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck! Wow, that mountain's coming up pretty fast! And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. I wanna fuck her hard. <laughs> Take a long if you know the words. <laughs> Hang on, wait, wait, wait. We got a, uh, we got a uh, vertical scroll. I, I, I hate it. It's not at an angle. I just tilt your screen back some. Oh. Okay. Hang on. Oh, there it is. I wonder if this was supposed to go in the car first. No, that's the suppository. A lot of edges to that suppository. He's Buckaroo Banzai. That's the sound it makes when it goes in. Well, he went through the wall. Well, no, he keeps, I mean, <laughs> like halfway through it. Oh, God! The glory hole! This was a glory hole! <laughs> <laughs> I am not keeping that in. You don't also star Jeff Goldblum, by God. You star Jeff Goldblum.
Jeff Goldblum is not an also. That was early Jeff Goldblum. You can forgive them for... Um, no, Jeff Goldblum Americans. walks into the casting call and he's like, what's this movie about? That sounds fun. You're going to cast me. And then they're like, yes, Jeff Goldblum, I want you to be in this movie. That's how Jeff Goldblum gets movies. I mean, it sounds right. I don't have enough evidence to dispute your claim. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen Barkin was very pretty before her checks to her plastic surgeon started bouncing. <laughs> That's mean. Not wrong. But... Yeah, where's the lie? <laughs> Never said he was wrong. I'm vibing in here. Really vibing in here. It's an intergalactic hotbox. <laughs> oh man, the walls are moving. <laughs> oh shit, dude. Whoa. What if? What if? What if? What if? Wait, wait. What if? What yeah, if, dude. Yeah, what if dude, we're? What like... if? What if? Oh, I know. What if the walls are sitting still, but we're moving? Whoa. What if we're the eighth dimensional beings all along? Of course, Jeff Goldblum is dressed like a 50s cowboy. Life, life finds a way. <laughs> and bend over. It's conjugal visit day. <laughs> Come over here for a little fuckaroo bonsai. <laughs> Not again. You put on this bubble wrap mask. <laughs> this script was written by 10-year-olds. John Lithgow, I want I, I want you to play this character in any movie that I ever decide to write. <laughs> Our people will call you. We need to get people. What are these guys? They're a rock band, they're scientists, they're doctors, and... They're cops. It's like, holy shit. God damn it, I'm a doctor, not a mechanical engineer. It slimed me. I feel so funky. <laughs> you spent this entire opening scene quoting better films. <laughs> this happened to be a helicopter <laughs> that flying by at that moment. The joke only works if you don't overthink it. This movie only works <laughs> if you don't overthink it. What yellow? What, wait, there's a yellow record? What happened to the red record? Dude, I, what? Let's start from first bullet point here, guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> this movie has taken so many turns. I don't know what direction it's in anymore. Where are you going with this, sir? Put John Lithgow on St. Green, please. To quote Dan, what is this movie? <laughs> <laughs> this movie brought to you by BF Goodrich and Monroe Shocks. And LSD. Movie brought to you by LSD. Lots and lots of LSD. John Lithgow consumed most of it. <laughs> and then everyone's like, no, he's just normally like that. No, this is him off the drugs. Oh my god, this movie is so fucking random. Like, he's like, why is there a watermelon there? Why wouldn't there be a watermelon there? Like, of course there's a watermelon there. Like, what are you fucking dumb, Jeff Goldblum? <laughs> <laughs> this movie would make less sense if there wasn't a watermelon randomly <laughs> right there. <laughs> I've gone five minutes. Apparently there's a plot critical watermelon. Yes. <laughs> yes. It took them ten years to write this script. Ten Years. Poor shit. I could come up with all this random shit tonight. <laughs> yeah, I just need a little bit more alcohol and or a lot of drugs. If I didn't have to work tomorrow, I'd have the sequels written too. <laughs> That's what this movie was missing. This beat. This threw it right over the edge. <laughs> I was wondering what was going to make this movie go full on ridiculous. One hour, 27 minutes in. Life finds a way. Why doesn't every movie end like this? Because they're not all as awesome as this. Not all movies can be Buckaroo Banzai. And now, back to the episode. So that, that was Buckaroo Banzai. <laughs> I am kind of glad I'm not the one who has to give final thoughts first. So being that as it may, Nigel, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to let you... I'm 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 on, a, I'm on vacation. <laughs> but would you give your final thoughts, please? I've been quoting OSW review all night, and I'm going to start with this state of this movie. Holy shit! Wow, this movie was something. I mean, it was written by multiple people who were all sharing a hundred and two degree fever. They <laughs> desperately, desperately, and I do mean desperately, needed medical attention, and no one gave it to them. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, it's just this movie is so fucking random. You know how like everyone says Endgame, the big scene in Endgame with the portals and all the Avengers showing up. Like that's the best real depiction of me playing in my toy box ever in cinema. No, this is the best depiction of me playing with my toy box ever on cinema because this is combining so many different toys, so many different genres, so many different plot points, all of them converging on one (laughs) in this beautiful, horrible symphony of shit. I mean, this movie, I just, Dan Dan broke the movie broke. Dan. It it did. It's like, I mean, I enjoyed this movie. I really did. I, I, it was stupid. It was so (laughs) stupid. It really was this movie. I'm not going to even remotely defend this. movie, And it wasn't like stupid, like in the same way that Tango and cash was stupid. That was fun. Stupid. This is stupid, stupid. (laughs) 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 Like, like, I mean, it's just like, it starts off with him doing brain surgery and then he goes and he, he breaks the dimensional barrier and then he goes and plays in a rock concert. And then he gets phone calls from the president because there's a spaceship in space or something like that. And then he starts seeing aliens like Rowdy Piper and they live. And then he's, you know, he gets another call from the president about like, uh, you know, what do you think this might be? Like the president's got no one else to call, but this millionaire astronaut space wizard guy. (laughs) It's like, holy shit. Holy shit. <laughs> These men needed desperate medical attention and no one gave it to them. But I'm going to ramble and I'd lo- I can't wait till we start combining some thoughts. So I'm going to pass things over to Tom. Elon Musk wishes he was Buckaroo Banzai. I just came to that epiphany. Everything Elon Musk does is because he wants to be Buckaroo Banzai. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, you're assessment is on point Nigel there is this is not a good film in the classic sense but it is a fun experience of a film for my end it still astounds me that this movie was a high budget film and simultaneously a low budget film it's just so much went into the making this film and you saw it with the sets and the props and the costumes and for the most part the alien costumes so near the end they started to look very um we got these at the last minute from the halloween store down the street um but just everything that went into making this film and at the same time it looks like something you would see at three in the morning on cinemax or at your bargain basement bin at the old video store it's corny it is absolutely corny i have more thoughts about the plot um yeah i'm going to focus on the effects and the budgets it's fascinating that the this movie was made the same year as Terminator, and it looks completely different from Terminator. In fact, I think Terminator may have had a lower budget, and it still seems like a higher budget movie than this. And yet somehow I think that adds to the charm, that weird cobbled together they just found stuff lying in dumpsters and put it together as well as these green not green screen but matte painting spaceships on um, on green screen and all of these all this equipment and this jury rigged ford truck to look like a rocket truck which probably actually had rockets in the back because if you're going to go big go big the charm of it had it been chrome or tin foil or something shiny, it just would not have helped add to the spirit of this movie. That DIY sort of flavor that helped make it kind of stand out from movies around this time. Not necessarily in the good way, but in an interesting and different way. I like this film. I liked it the first time. I still like it. But I think we might have um, a third opinion to go to. Josh, are you still alive? Did you cross the eighth dimension? 
I, I'm on vacation. And that's it for tonight's show. As, <laughs> that has been literally his mantra through the, almost all of this movie. Um, this movie was <laughs> this, this. Let's just let's just call a, a spade a spade. This movie was bad. <laughs> No one here is saying it's good. No, no, no. <laughs> I, uh, I honestly, okay. The one concern I have with this movie, you have only one. Is, uh, no, no. Okay, the top concern. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Thanks for clarifying. Top I was concern. confused. <laughs> well, considering we just watched Buckaroo Bonsai, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> of all the things that happened in the past hour and forty some odd minutes, they never explained the watermelon, <laughs> and that's. Well, that was actually a setup for the sequel that never happened. The watermelon and was I'm actually going to play a crucial role. I, I was imagining so, but then that, that watermelon, man, I just, I finished the show tonight and I'm just like, what about the watermelon? <laughs> just, this was just so ridiculous. I just, I don't know. I'm broken. Um, <laughs> Do we need to I, call you a doctor, Josh? Speaking of needing medical attention. No, this is like, you know, Dan, you say that this is like uh, in it, uh, kids playing with toys in the basement. No, no, no. Tango and Cash was you and your best friend playing in the basement with your toys. This was one kid playing in the basement with all the toys his friends left over from the sleepover the night before. That or like, you know how like when we were kids, you'd go to the doctor's office and uh, they'd have like a bin of toys but it was all like toys that other kids had either left behind at the doctor's office or some like random summer. So you had like, you know, like you had like Lion-O from the Thundercats and like a couple of My Little Ponies in there mm-hmm. and like some Tonka trucks and then like yeah, uh, yeah. a like, broken a, and missing like their yeah, accessories. And a, a Batman figure and like, you know, G.I. Joe's weapons, but no G.I. Joe's to be found anywhere. So it's yeah, like, yeah. it's all that random shit. That, that's what this movie is. Yeah, yeah. This movie was... Um... So random. And some of the lines that was spoken was just so random. And do, or, do any stand yeah. out, Josh? Any standout lines? No. Okay. Because I I really, I don't know. This movie just hurt. <laughs> like, I didn't get, you know, PTSD from it. But yeah, this movie was bad. Top 1,000 movies to watch before you die. Make this the last one because it'll probably kill you. <laughs> That's uh, that's all I got for final thoughts. We could go into the group thoughts now, but <laughs> now, oh my god! <laughs> now, did you you paid attention to the film at least, right? I tried. I legitimately tried. I wasn't on my phone the entire time. I will grant the phone that. If I had to give this movie a barren review, it's like an hour thirty out of an hour forty some odd minutes. I didn't pick up my phone the entire time. I wish I would have, <laughs> but I didn't. Well, then you would have missed like critical moment. I went to use the restroom for five minutes. I come back it's like something's happened. What happened to the girl? What's going on? Who's that guy? There's a watermelon now. Yes, I will admit that um, John Lithgow and Jeff Goldblum were amazing. I want to see more of them. <laughs> period. Like I'm glad that they continued acting after this. Peter Weller, I am surprised he got RoboCop. They're like, what were you in? Okay. <laughs> well, he also had other roles outside of this. So, um, incidentally, Nigel, are you talking? No, I I was on mute because huh? I was typing up another thought while Josh was talking. And it wouldn't sound like a machine gun going off. Or a typewriter. Okay. No, I, I, I sense that you were trying to say something at that. No, 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 no. I, I said my piece about the toys at the doctor's office. And then I didn't want to jump all over Josh's thoughts some more. So I shut myself up. Okay, you're fine. That was that was a beautiful analogy, though, that added onto mine because that was like Sid in Toy Story. All of his toys. Mm-hmm. That was this movie. Yes, yes. All the tortured souls under the bed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, falling out. Yes. What a fever dream this movie was. I mean, it really just this movie is so goddamn random. It was just. It reminds me um when. Um, I, I posted this on the Discord and the Facebook, um, but when they were doing like the table read and brainstorming this, uh, or brainstorming Indiana Jones, Spielberg and Lucas pointed out they wanted to do um, Indiana Jones in the style of the old serials 
where there was a cliffhanger at the end of each episode and you had to tune in next time to see what happened. Only he wanted to make sure to combine it and edit it in a way that it could make sense and have narrative flow over an hour and a half to our movie. They forgot that last part when making this film. There was like no connective tissue whatsoever. It's just like, and this thing is happening now. Next episode, next scene. Yeah, next like I event. said, I think I said it earlier in the movie. It's like, like, well, we, you know how like we come up with the skits for our show. And sometimes like, you know, Tom writes a little bit and then Josh writes a little bit. But we, we build on what the other guy is doing. We don't just kind of like change it mid sentence to, you know, and now there's aliens. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's what this is. It'd be like if Josh wrote like the first couple lines of the cold open and then like, okay. And he's like, Hey Dan, I need you to write the interspersal. And my interspersal has nothing to do with what Josh set up in the cold open. Mm -hmm. So if you re and Johnson to my, my force awakens kind of, yeah, but we don't even bother walking it back. We're just fuck it. It's, this is how it is now. And you know, and then the, the stinger also has nothing to do with, your cold open or my interspersal. It's just ridiculous. You know, it's, and, it's that one community episode uh, where Abed and them are making a movie with clips from Chang and they're just like improv oh, yeah. everything as they go. It's like Andy they have like the, the 35 second clip from Chang. Yeah, that's <laughs> what this movie was. Sorry, no, I, I no, 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 it, you didn't at all. No, you guys were just adding to what I was saying. I mean, this movie, like I said, Josh was like, well, I'm just going to call it space. This movie was bad. No one here in this group is calling this movie good. No. I'm sure there's someone out there that's calling this movie good. The, the three of those people are not in this room right now. But um, this movie was just, it was bad, but it was also random, fun, stupid, stupid. <laughs> it's yeah. just... I would, I, I think I would have to say this movie is about 60% hard ticket to Hawaii. <laughs> 20% Flash Gordon, 40% Tango and Cash, and maybe 15% Swashbuckler. Those don't add up to 100%, yes, but I, that's in line with the movie. I'll say this. <laughs> I enjoyed this a lot more than Swashbuckler. I enjoyed yes. this a lot more than Flash Gordon. Yes. Like, I really enjoyed this a lot more. Like, Flash Gordon's a Mary Sue and Buckaroo Banzai is a Mary Sue. But the difference between the two movies is that that kind of plays as a joke in this movie, that he's so good at everything and he's the best at everything. And Flash Gordon, it just... Because the writers were lazy and didn't yes. know how to establish a character. Buckaroo Banzai, he's so sensitive. He can hear a woman crying in a crowded bar. <sighs> yeah. This is one of the few times that I would say that being a Mary Sue did not ruin the film. Because, like I said, it was played as a joke. Not yeah. so much. It was part of the humor and the charm of the movie. Not something that's because the writer's fucking lazy. Can't come up with anything better. Can't okay. write real conflict. But yeah, it's like to go back to a season one thing that Tom would do. Would I recommend this movie? Only if I can be there and be drunk and or stoned while watching you watch it. <laughs> Why do you think <laughs> I've been so excited for you guys to watch this? So what are you smoking tonight, Tom? Nothing, because I have to work in the morning tomorrow. And aquarium gravel. What now? Gravel? <laughs> what? Yes. I said aquarium gravel. Yes. I had three beers while watching this movie, and that was about a third of what was necessary. <laughs> Again, this is my second time seeing it, and yet I think it, your experience, the both of you, is what's really adding this to me, or adding it for me, I should say. But you could definitely tell this was a fun movie for everyone to make. I kept noticing like everyone corpsing or in scenes. Like, yes. like Clancy Brown was just like, holding his face in his hand, trying to hide that he's laughing. It's like, that was the best take. They could not get a better take. Mm -hmm. Dude, yeah, John Lithgow. Oh my God, it's amazing they had any scenery left because he ate it all. <laughs> yes. Yeah, oh, and apparently him? from what I was reading, it, um, he improvised a shit ton of his lines and people had a hard time holding their shit together. That whole speech that he's giving on the megaphone or whatever and, and Christopher Lloyd's like banging on the wall. And because he wants him to shut up, it's because he can't stop laughing. He's just like, because every take was something because he'd start laughing and the director would yell cut and they'd go again. And John Lithgow's lines would be completely different because he, that way they wouldn't expect a joke again and they'd start laughing again. God, but yeah, John Lithgow was definitely the standout. Jeff Goldblum was a close second. 
And then the watermelon. <laughs> and then the watermelon. <laughs> Props to the watermelon, man. It's uh, yeah. really brought the room together. Yeah. <laughs> so we all agree this was a bad film, but a fun bad film. Yes. I, I, I would definitely put it at better than Flash Gordon and more cult quality than Flash Gordon. Yeah, this movie does have a charm to it. I can see why people like this movie. Why, like, this is a cult classic. Why this movie is not revered, but kind of like, you know, like, well, yeah, culty. You know, like, I can see why people like it. But when we were watching Flash Gordon, I'm sitting there going, how did this movie have a following? Because, like you said, nobody who actually likes the movie sees the movie. Yeah. I'm curious. I'm going to look this up real quick. When was Flash Gordon made? 1980. Yeah, 1980. Oh, exactly 1980. Okay, I thought it was made maybe uh, made maybe around the same time. Okay. Yeah, Flash Gordon. Ugh. Ugh. You know, I, I wonder if the people went to the theaters to watch this, and then, like, just a couple of months later, they went to go watch Terminator, and they're like, oh, that's what a good movie's like. Very, very possible. More than likely, yes. And then Indiana Jones yeah. and the Temple of Doom, and then... Well, that came out before, remember? I thought it was the same year. It did. It just it came out before this one. Uh, that, yeah, oh, that's right. That's that was right. like on its 10th or 12th week of release. So, so people went to see Temple of Dooms like, oh, my God, that's a terrible Indiana Jones. Let's check out this Buckaroo Banzai. Never mind. It was good. Yeah, Buckaroo Banzai. Hold my beer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so suddenly Temple of Dooms is a classic. But <laughs> yeah, like I said, I enjoyed I had fun watching this movie. Uh if Josh was saying he wouldn't recommend it, I would say this is definitely, this is the kind of movie you'd really do need to watch with a couple of friends, get a couple of friends together, watch this film. It's stupid fun. Like it's just a stupid, stupid, stupid movie, but you'll have fun watching it. Did, did I even say if I would recommend it? Or not? I don't know. You didn't say off of you it. could, if you could, if you could partake on the beer or. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. So Josh's short term memory is complete shit now. So <laughs> yeah, he went head first in the interdimensional glory hole and he's come back a little Lizardo. Um, so I've hit all my notes and then some. All right. Well, that's it for tonight's show. <laughs> we ho we're, we're thankful for that. So thank you. <laughs> But as a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever fine podcasts are made and sold. Our regular episodes are Tuesdays at 6 p.m., so please like and subscribe on whatever medium you choose. It really helps us out. And if you can leave a review, a written review, or just go on and rate us five stars, we would really appreciate it. We had some issues with our iTunes um, page, but that seems to be all resolved now. Oh, thank God. And Yeah, that was... Um, I think it was just, I don't know what it was, but it's fixed now. Our reviews are showing back up and our you can actually search us again. So we didn't tell anybody about that because, well, I was on vacation. and <laughs> um, But that's all I've got. <laughs> and be sure to join our Discord channel as well. The link can be found in the episode description at discord.me slash firepit. There you'll get notifications of new episodes. And even better, you get to hear about how Josh is on vacation. So join I'm making a shirt. <laughs> but hop on in and join the discussion with the other fans. It is a fun time, whether you're on vacation or not. And you can email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Mention back in the interspersal. If you want to send us a long message, a short message, a happy message, a sad message, you, I don't know, whatever. Also, please like our Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at firepitcce. Uh, both are linked in the episode's description as well. You'll get notifications of new episodes and whatnot, uh, just like on the Discord channel. So, And you can leave us some feedback, discuss the episodes. Um, it's a good time in the social media. Yeah, I uh, would like to shout out, first and foremost, my wife and son. Um, by the time this episode premieres, they will have just had a birthday. My son turned 10, my wife turned 35. So happy birthday to both of you. And also, I'd like to shout out my parents for putting up with my ass for two weeks while I was on vacation. Take a drink. Actually, no, don't do it. Don't. If you have been, you're pretty knackered. But also, final shout out to Sync Lounge and Plex for hosting our viewing experiences. I uh, host the Plex server that uh, hosts all the movies that we've been watching, and that is back in Ohio while I am in Oklahoma. And uh, Tom and Dan are both back in Ohio, but we're able to watch this in sync not the band, while I am 
on vacation. So thank you again for hosting that. And I'd like to shout out a few of our latest Facebook followers, Sean Begg and Lydia, two of the hundreds and growing numbers of our followers on well the Facebook page. Whether you join in regularly, just popped in, uh, I'd like to just show up here and there just to see what we post or regularly listen to the episodes. I want to thank you for stopping in and keeping the fire pits burning. And I also want to give a um, kudos and shout out to Mike Granger uh, here in Columbus. He was uh, he's done a couple horror movie marathons, the Terror from the 80s over at Studio 35 and Grandview. Also uh, produced the revival of the Fritz the Night Owl show. I want to give him some kudos for his recent find. He was able to secure a pair of 70 millimeter prints of Halloween. So actual film of the uh, John Carpenter uh, Halloween film. Uh, So kudos to him. And finally, I want to shout out the tool that makes my editing possible. Audacity. Audacity is the editing software, which I use to take all of our recordings, our thoughts, our comments, and put them into this nice, concise format that you're listening to now, adding in, of course, the bits of Foley and music that help to make it perk. Audacity is free software, so I'm not paying them a dime to use them, and they're not paying me a dime to sponsor them or say anything good about them. But I, so far, don't have many bad things to say about it. So if you want to do a podcast of your own or just make a recording for the hell of it, can't go wrong with Audacity. And uh, I would like to shout out myself because um, I had a birthday, but my two co-hosts didn't want to shout me out this week. So that's cool. Oh, wait. Happy, happy birthday, Dan. And a special happy, shout happy, out to Dan. Yes, we were waiting until after your shout out. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, actually, um, uh. Special shout out to Peggy, the OG friend of the channel. Appreciate your support. Appreciate you always listening in. Can't wait to hang out with you in person next week. Also, special shout out to Rob at Rob's Custom PCs, a fellow cancer in a good way. We have both have July birthdays. So uh, happy birthday to Rob of Rob's Custom PCs. And we really did love having him on the show. Uh, joined us for Raiders of the Lost Art. Hope you listened to that episode. It was great fun. Rob really enjoyed himself hanging out with us on the show. And another special shout out to Zencaster, the recording program or the recording. Yeah, the recording program we use for our podcast. Saving our bacon numerous times. Always getting our uh, episodes downloaded and then uploaded in in very quick succession and just awesome. It saved our bacon so many times after Skype shit the bed, which is why Skype doesn't get shout outs anymore. So yes, <laughs> shit the bed, but don't get shouted out. Yeah. You lose the greatest selection section episode ever. You don't get shouted out anymore. So special shout out to Zencaster. Thanks a lot. And again, like Tom mentioned, uh, we don't pay f- to use them and they're not paying for us to talk about them, but we love them so much. We can't just help shout them out. Thank you very much. Okay. But in all seriousness, Dan, it is, uh, I think we, we, we are recording on your birthday. So special happy birthday to you. Thank Do you, you mind if I say your age? No, oh, no, that's fine. All right. So special happy birthday to you on your 40th birthday. So thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. Big four O. Now, well, now our audience knows why most of our destination films are 90s and 80s films. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Happy birthday, Nigel. Yes. Thank you, guys. Lordy, lordy, you've turned 40. Oh, stop. I'm going to get enough yes. of that at my party next week, so let's not. Yes. But you know one thing else is uh, there can be only one of us who's turning 40 first, and that's Dan. Yes, yes, it is. And speaking of turning 40 first, and speaking of staying in the 80s, <laughs> and speaking of movies where the only way you can explain it is it's a kind of magic, and speaking of movies that are defined by Queen's soundtrack, <laughs> Tom, where are we going next week? Well, Nigel, we're going to a distant past 300 years ago, and then to a distant past of 1980s in... Highlander. The original. The good one. Yes. Yeah, no, just, just, yeah, emphasize that for the audience. The good one. Yeah, <laughs> okay. No bloody two, 
three, <laughs> four, or a TV show. Although the TV show was pretty banger up until the later seasons. But yes. So is this a uh, lander from Oklahoma? Because like medicinal marijuana is a thing down here. What? <laughs> the, the, the lander. He's a high lander. Oh God! Oh my God! Oh, quickly, geez. quickly! No! <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. This movie broke my brain. Oh my God, Josh, get us out of here. <laughs> so, so, uh, I've been on vacation. <laughs> I've been Josh. I've been Tom, and I've been Dan. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment LLC. Stay safe out there. Is this? Did you fill this with coins? I was mining bitcoins, sir. You know, make a little side money. I mean, that and I think you need a better graphics card. It really didn't work right. That's not how bitcoins work at all! You're in tech support too! You know this! Gee, now how am I going to stream tonight's movie? Well, just use the spare laptop over there. Fine. Just let me swap the connection. Give me that! Hey! There! No more Tombot ever. He's done. He's to bed. Whoa. Future uses. How can we be sure? No. No. Stop. Bad Tom. We already did the Bill and Ted bit. I get it. This is Terminator 2. Time travel happens. But we're not going to do a time travel storyline. But Wait, I mean, no, it, it just makes just sense in the plot. No, no, no. Executive decision. We're saving it for Back to the Future. Wink. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah that good. makes sense. Yeah, uh, you know. that's good. Yeah. All right. Pass Dan. Give this to me in five seconds. He'll know what to do with it. Oh, um, gross. <laughs> What the hell is that thing? I don't know. It looks like some sort of alien egg. Hey guys, what's going on? <laughs> and there goes our setup for the alien skit. Great job, Josh. Back to vacation with you. What, what's crawling out of the thing? Hey, oh, look at how look how cute it is! It's crawling. Oh my god! Oh, oh god! Tom is dead. What's that bursting out of his chest? Oh god! No. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> <laughs>